When we start doing t-tests, it's important to realize that conceptually, they are nearly identical to z-tests. So if you have a good understanding about the fundamentals of z-tests, you'll be in a good position to understand t-tests. To illustrate this, let's have an example where I want to know whether having people eat spinach will make them run faster and for longer than people just in the general population. Okay, so I'm introducing some manipulation. I'm having people eat spinach and I'm seeing how far they can run before they collapse and die. I know that in the general population, the mean distance somebody can run is 8.8 .8 miles before they collapse and die, but I have no idea what the variance or the standard deviation of the population is. And that's very common when we do statistics, which is why t-tests are so ubiquitous. In this case, let's say I have a sample of five people. I have them eat spinach, I measure how long they run. Yeah. So eight miles, 10 miles, nine miles, 11, 11, and the mean is 9.8 for this sample. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna estimate the variance and the standard deviation of the population. That's a critical difference between t-tests and t-tests. We estimate the standard deviation. So this whole procedure for the sum of squares, if, you're, if you've been doing variance calculations, it's pretty similar. We just take the mean, we subtract that from each of these scores. So 8 minus 9.8 is negative 1.8, and we do that for all the values. And then we square each of those differences, and then we add all of those differences up to get the sums of squares, or SS. In this case, it's 6.8. Now here's where it gets different with t-tests as compared to z-tests. To estimate the variance of the population, we represent variance as s squared here, we take our sums of squares but we don't divide it by n because that's going to produce a biased estimator of the variance. I'm not going to get into it now but if you want there's a link to a video which explains why we do this. Instead, we divide by the degrees of freedom which is simply the number of people in our sample, or n, minus 1. Okay, so in this case, degrees of freedom is 4, because we had 5 people, 5 minus 1 is 4. And we get a value of 1.7 for the variance, or s squared. Since we divided by the degrees of freedom, this is an unbiased estimate of the population variance. Next step. To get the standard deviation, the estimated standard deviation, we simply take the square root of the variance, or square root of 1.7, and we get a value of 1.3. Okay. That's really the only difference in computations between t-tests and z-tests. Now we want to get the standard error of the mean, right? because we want to know how far does our sample mean differ from the population mean in terms of standard error of the mean, or standard deviations, of our sampling distribution of the mean. So we just take the estimated standard deviation and we divide it by the square root of n, the number of subjects or observations in our sample, which is 5. So 1.3 divided by square root of 5 is 0.58. This last step to calculate the t value, this should look very, very similar to calculating a z score or a z statistic. And it is. We simply subtract the population mean from our sample mean, and we divide that by our estimated standard error of the mean. So we're getting our difference from the population mean in terms of standard error. And that is our t-score, t-value, t-statistic, whatever. And we get a value here of 1.72. Right. Last thing we need to be aware of, is with t-tests, we use a t-distribution to see whether this t-statistic is actually extreme enough to reject the null hypothesis or not. Now, I was doing a one-tailed test, and I had a cutoff threshold of 0.05. My alpha was 0.05. If this were just a simple z-test, a value of 1.72 would be enough to reject the null hypothesis if it were a one-tailed test. But in this case, we need to be aware of the degrees of freedom in our sample. Okay, when you see a t table, you'll see the degrees of freedom in one column, and then you'll see each cutoff and the associated t statistic for each of those degrees of freedom. 
And it turns out that with four degrees of freedom, a T statistic of 1.72 is not enough to reject the null hypothesis.